This is What's It Like with Dr. Ken Tangen. Hi, this is Ken Tangen. This is episode 74 of What's It Like. My guest is Aaron Fulkerson, somewhere in San Diego. Hey, Aaron. Hi, how's it going tonight? I'm doing good. So did you grow up in that area? No, um, I'm currently uh, in Mission Hills, where I live with my wife and uh, two children. Uh, but I grew up in the Bay Area, um, Morgan Hill, actually, which was really rural when I grew up there, and uh, now is basically a suburb of San Jose. Oh. So did you come from a large family? Uh, no, I've got a brother and sister, and um, yeah, so... You know, two point five, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> right in the average, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, who had the biggest influence on your life when you were growing up? Well, you know, I had a grandfather uh, who was on my adopted father's side, who um, was uh, very influential and and had me very interested in metaphysics and philosophy and religion um, when I was young. You know, ten, twelve years old. Uh, and, um, so he was really influential. You know, he had me read, uh, W. Sever said moms, the razor's edge, mm -hmm. uh, um, had me interested in ethics and, uh, world religions and philosophy. So, uh, he was pretty influential. My mother was pretty influential, uh, uh, because she was, you know, so entrepreneurial and, um, uh, high energy. Um, so she was probably pretty influential too. I mean, both my parents, I should say. What was your major challenge as a child? Oh, you know, I was um, pretty high energy um, to, to a fault. So, uh, you know, growing up it was difficult to, uh, um, I guess, fit in for that reason. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I got in a lot of trouble growing up as a kid. And uh, it was mostly just, you know, lots of, lots of energy. Is there a particular childhood experience do you think that has contributed most to who you are today? I don't know if I can identify a singular one. Um, I remember, I remember, uh, uh, there's kind of an amalgamation of events that has contributed significantly to who I am today. I mean, on, on one side there's, um, when I started my first business when I was in the fourth grade and, um, I made, uh, um, uh, homemade glue that was edible and sold it to uh, fourth graders. And it was a short-lived short -lived fad. Um, but, you know, that's like one of several events that I realized how much I loved just like, you know, product <laughs> <laughs> and selling product. Um, you know, I mean, I love making product, you know, that's why I went into engineering. But uh, I remember also uh, I'd visit my grandfather in Florida and, I would just like pitch people as a, I mean, I'm talking eight, nine, 10 years old, whatever. I'd, I'd just pitch people, uh, that complete strangers. Um, and it was kind of like my first business when I was in the fourth grade, you know, where I was basically pitching people. But then the other side of it was, um, you know, I got exposed very early to, uh, um, philosophy, uh, Buddhism in particular. And that's something that really resonated with me at a really young age. And I got really fascinated with like, you know, mythology, Joseph Campbell, and um, psychology, and um, uh, I mean, uh, I, so there's kind of two things. One, where I was really uh, interested in, in, in metaphysics and um, uh, epistemology, and then on the other side of it, uh, I was really, I really am passionate about, like, uh, starting things and business, uh, you know? So there's kind of two, two things that were uh, confluence of events. Uh, I wouldn't pick like one individual one. Mm -hmm. Are you a practicing Buddhist now? Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I, I think um, mostly, probably, yeah. I, I, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> You're not sure? Yeah, I mean... Um, well, metaphysics is like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if, if I align with any organized uh, philosophy or religion, it's definitely Buddhism more than, than any other, yeah. Mm-hmm. Aside from uh, selling edible glue, what was school like for you? Uh, it was really tough, mm. really, really challenging for me. Um, yeah, uh, I had a lot of difficulty all the way through school. You know, I graduated high school with a 
uh, 1.67 GPA. <laughs> but you made it through. Yeah. Um, most people, when I tell them that, uh, respond with, I didn't know you could graduate with a 1.67. <laughs> and um, but evidently you can, but I don't think you can with a 1.66. <laughs> <laughs> but you went on from there to do a variety of things. Yeah, so I, I kind of, um, from there, I um, became what probably previous generations would call a Dharma bum, and <laughs> the current generation would call an anarchist. <laughs> well, or at least an explorer. Yeah, so, you know, I kind of hit the road and um, did that for a few years, and uh, did a lot of backpacking, hitchhiking, canoeing, camping, um, you know, I was living very much, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd cook, um, uh, and, um, travel and cook and travel and, and really love that. And then I met my wife in Northern Minnesota of all places. <laughs> and, uh, she was graduating with her degree in elementary education. How did you meet her? Oh, I was applying for a job at a uh, country club and, uh, as a, as a, a sous chef. And um, I'd actually come out of the woods. Um, I had not worked for months. And, um, you know, I didn't have any money. I had a $200 car, but didn't have gas money. So I, I walked to the interview, and I was sitting down with the executive chef at this at Northland Country Club in, in Duluth, Minnesota. And, um, you know, really hit it off with the, the executive chef. And uh, uh, this woman walked in, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and um, she walked right up to me in the middle of the interview and, uh, um, she started, uh, hitting on me in the middle of the interview or talking to me. And, um, that was, uh, 15 years, two months and seven, seven days ago. <laughs> so her and I, uh, became really good friends and, uh, um, she graduated about a year later with her undergraduate degree and we backpacked together a little bit and, uh, then I said that I should probably get in school. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, you know, uh, I think I think I want to do something in like history or philosophy, uh, you know, really dig into metaphysics and, and epistemology. And Duke University has got a great program. And um, so I, I considered doing that. And then I was like, well, you know, what else I really like is this um, whole Internet thing is really exciting. And uh, I grew up programming uh, as a kid. I was, a, you know, would write code. Uh, really enjoyed doing that, and um, really, I always had a passion for mathematics. In fact, um, so I was like, well, you know, maybe I should do this whole computer science track. And uh, that was it. Was then I realized that uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina, just uh, about I guess eight or ten miles away from Duke, um, had one of the top ten computer science programs in the world. And um, uh, I said, you know what? Let's just go to uh, North Carolina and, um, I'll, I'll enroll at Chapel Hill. And, uh, she said that my wife, Tara said that, well, you know, it's, they, <clears throat> I did some research and they only accept about 15% of their applicants. I was like, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, two days later we drove down and, uh, she got a job there and, and, uh, um, I got a job a little bit after that cooking. And, um, then, <clears throat> You know, I started at the uh, junior college in Durham, Durham Technical Community College, and uh, by way of seeing how challenged Tara's uh, um, students were, she was teaching elementary school, and, and there in Durham, and it was an underserved Title One uh, school with at-risk kids. And it was really rough. I saw just you know these kids. They they um, I it was it was interesting. I realized that they would live their life within a 15 mile uh, uh, radius area and they, they really would never leave that mm -hmm. area and um it was very cyclical uh so I, I thought that was really interesting and i thought well i wonder what would happen if i expose these kids to other cultures and other places and i'll use the internet to do it so um i helped tara set up a computer lab in in her school uh cc spalding it was a title one magnet school there in durham and um uh, I started uh, uh, some help help to start some nonprofits with uh, uh, the first community center in our school, and then um, uh, we spread to other public housing communities that have rec rooms. I started getting computers from 
uh, a variety of different sources, corporations that were giving them away because they were cycling them out uh, because, you know, oh, wow, these are, you know, two years old or three years old and we need to upgrade. So um, uh, in all, I set up 16 community centers and, and what I realized was that a lot of the violence within these these communities ran uh, along gang lines that are drawn around the public housing communities. So I uh, realized that, well, if I can get these, these kids to work on projects together across the different public housing communities, um, we would probably make friends with these people and, and uh, uh, prevent violence. And that's exactly what we did. So um, I started, I started a, a busing them from the different public housing communities to other, basically putting them in a bag, shaking them up, and then making them work on, on projects together that involve technology, right? Uh, you know, mostly at first they wanted to just like go to the 50, 50 cents website. And, um, uh, but you know, once they realized that no, if they're, they'll be able to do that after they do the structured lesson and work collaboratively with each other. Well, what ended up happening was, um, it was a big success. We, we drove down, uh, violent crimes by, um, it was like, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20%. I don't remember exactly, hmm. uh, wherever our, 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 uh, community centers were. So, um, that was a big success. And then the other thing that we did was we said, well, uh, how do we, how do we, um, connect with the parents? Because I would, I would literally have, uh, um, two year olds that would get on our, our buses, uh, well, they were church vans. I partnered with the, the local churches to get transportation. Um, and, uh, I would literally have two year olds that would wander into my labs with, with no, no, no parents, no, no older siblings, they're just walking around the, the public housing communities that were really rough and, you know, violence and drugs and whatnot. So I was like, man, I got to find a way to connect with the parents. So I was like, well, how can I do that? And the only thing we had was we had a ton of computers, right? So uh, what we started doing was we were, we'd get the parents to come into classes to uh, learn how to rebuild the, the computers and learn how to use them. And then uh, we'd give them a computer at the end of the class. So they'd have mm-hmm. to get education. Um, so that was a big success too. And, uh, a bunch of them, um, uh, or several of them that I knew of in the short period that I was, I was there for, I guess about three years. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they started going to Durham technical community college as well. So anyway, I, I did that for a little bit and, um, gratefully, uh, managed to get, um, the Jack Kent cook scholarship, which is the largest scholarship in the United States. And, uh, um, uh, then of course I had kind of the red carpet treatment at, at Chapel Hill. Um, so that, that's kind of my, my education college experience. Hmm. So what exactly do you do? Well, uh, you know, I guess to, uh, keep with the chronology, I was recruited out of college to work at Microsoft, uh, in, uh, um, pretty prestigious, uh, small research team that reported to one of the CTOs. There was about 14 people in the team and uh, we were researching distributed systems. Uh, so, you know, how do you deal with like highly concurrent systems? Um, so we did, it was heavy mathematics, really fun stuff. And I worked with, I had the good fortune of working with people like Chuck Thacker, who did the first graphical user interface at Xerox Park, which was, you know, of course adapted by Mac, by Apple with the Mac and, and of course windows with, by Microsoft. Um, and, and other people too, that were in that 14 person team. I just completely got lucky. I mean, I'm just lucky. Uh, but, um, you were a programmer there. I, I was a program manager, so I helped them to, uh, capture their collective knowledge and then disseminate it through the rest of Microsoft. Mm. Uh, so I was there for, for, I was, that was 2003 and I met my co-founder of MindTouch, which is, uh, the company that I'm, uh, one of the founders and the CEO of. And um, his name's Steve Bjorg. Uh, we met there, and um, what we realized was there weren't any good technologies for capturing knowledge and disseminating it. You know, I was really struggling with it at Microsoft. And, uh, you know, SharePoint didn't really – it's really focused on files and stuff, so it didn't work well. Um, so what I wanted to do I, – I, I had some, some – uh, ideas about having an environment that was collaborative for authoring content and publishing content. But my approach was all wrong. And I, I talked to Steve, my co-founder about it. He's like, yeah, that's a great idea. But what it should look like is it should look a lot like a wiki. And a wiki is uh, kind of a really simple website that anybody mm-hmm. can edit. You know, Wikipedia, of course. Right. 
So I thought, wow, that's a great idea for what the user experience metaphor should look like. And uh, I said, well, let's let's we should, you know, he he suggested, well, let's do a company about this. You know, I was like, that sounds like a great idea. So we started MindTouch, and uh, we started MindTouch in 2005. And originally, we released it as an open source project, which means that we uh, put the source code out there for anybody to use, kind of like Linux or the Firefox browser. They're both open source. And um, we launched the project in uh, 2006, and then um, you know we released the source code and, and launched an open source community. People could submit back code or you know bug fixes, you know bugs or whatever you know. And um, <clears throat> by a year later, uh, it was the um, uh, number four most popular open source project in the world out of 300,000 of them. Uh, as was ranked by SourceForge.net, which was at that time the only and definitive source for open source projects. That's where everybody went back then in 07. Uh, So, you know, within a very short period of time, it became this incredibly popular open source project that uh, is now used by tens of millions of people. How did you start the company? Was it an expensive project or did you just guys get together and make it out of thin air? Um, no, we, we bootstrapped it, so it wasn't like uh, like a venture capital back where we raised like twenty five million dollars, and you know that's that's not how we approached it. Um, we originally approached it with there was there was about uh, I guess from the beginning four of us mm-hmm. in two thousand five, and um, you know we focused on just shipping the product, and uh, then for the next year, you know I we decided well. Instead of selling it, let's just get it out there and see if uh, if people think it's as important as we do. And, and clearly they did uh, because suddenly we were doing thousands of downloads a day. And um, then in, in uh, 2008, um, you know, there was about six or – I guess there was probably – probably maybe six to eight of us or something. And uh, um, I decided, well, gosh, you know. I was like, man, you know, there's a lot of people using this. We should, we should sell something. So <laughs> <laughs> I got on the phone and started calling people that had uh, installed it and suggested that, hey, you know, you should probably buy support. And, um, you know, our 2008, we, we made our first uh, million bucks. Uh, and, you know, then we started adding salespeople and uh, marketing people. And then we became really focused on one particular use case instead of this kind of like broad category of, you know, enterprise collaboration. Um, we became really focused on, uh, well, technology companies and helping them to help their end users understand how to use their products better. Mm. You know, we want, you know, we, we got pulled in the direction because so many of our customers and users were already using us for this, like Intuit and PayPal and, you know, Mozilla, the makers of Firefox and Intel, Microsoft, you know, all these big technology companies were using us for just delivering better product help and technical documentation. So instead of here's your PDF and it's exactly the print manual, it's, it's something that's much more, um, dynamic, uh, web ready, uh, social. And, um, you know, and by 2009, that's really what we focused on. And, um, you know, we've, we've done really well by focusing on that particular use case. It's, it's a real problem for companies. Mm -hmm. What's the best thing about your job? Um, the people I work with. Yeah. I mean, I love my work. Uh, I love, um, I, that's, yeah, I I love what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, it's definitely the people I work with. Uh, people are fascinating, and um, you know, it's 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 really gr- it's really amazing to uh, help build a product, um, see that product just take off with tens of millions of users, and whoa, that was that was amazing. <laughs> and then see people spend lots of money for that product, and mm-hmm. you know, really change fundamentally how they do certain aspects of their business. Um, that's that's a lot of fun, you know. But really, it's it's the people, it's the customers, it's the people. It's not just the people I work with. When I say the people I work with, that, that, that's customers too. Um, yeah, that's that's really the best thing is just being able to have so many interactions with so many different people. It's something that I've always learned a great deal from. Uh, probably because I'm so extroverted, you know. I verbalize everything. That's how I think through problems is by verbalizing it. Um, so 
you know, I think that, uh, yeah, people. Let me turn the question around. What's the worst thing about your job? Um, people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, making hard decisions that affect people. That, that's certainly the worst part of it. Uh, you know, there's times when uh, your your coworkers aren't the best fit for the company, and you have to make tough decisions about that. Um, there's times when I've made mistakes by giving people that I work with too much autonomy, because that's what I thrive with, uh, is autonomy and independence, and um, that's the kind of environment I thrive in, And but not everybody thrives in that environment, and, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, you know, been one of my biggest mistakes and one of my biggest lessons over the last couple of years is, you know, I remember when I ran restaurants, and, um, you know, I grew up, my parents owned restaurants, and I grew up in restaurants, heck, I was running one when I was 15 by myself. Uh, so I, I would never, ever imagine, uh, giving autonomy inside that environment <laughs> because, you know, it's just that they're, they're, they're low wage employees. They're, uh, they're, it's, it's, it's not like a career for them. Right. So it's just a job. It doesn't really matter to them. Nobody cares as much as you do when you're the owner. Right. Uh, I would never, ever imagine giving them autonomy and it's, it's interesting uh, how similar um, – I mean, business is business, right? It's the same. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're running a restaurant or running a software company. It's fundamentally the same, and that's one of the things I've learned uh, over the last couple of years is, um, yeah, you have to be careful with people just because um, you give them too much independence and, and it, it scares them. Yeah, everyone's different. Yeah. So to go back to your question, what's what's the worst thing about it is, um, oh, the worst thing is is having to make hard decisions that affect people. What type of person would be good at your job? Oh, as a CEO or entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, somebody who is pathologically optimistic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody who is just uh, you, you have to be really confident. You have to be really really confident and. Um, um, if, if you're, uh, you, it's, it's like when, when they analyze athletes and uh, those who uh, think that they're better than everybody else actually perform better. Well, I mean, that's, that's true too with entrepreneurs, you know? Um, you can't, what, another thing I've learned over the years is you can't be too modest uh, because people don't want you to be modest. <laughs> people who report to you really don't want you to be modest. Uh, they want to have blind faith. And if you can't give them that, uh, that, that level of authority of that level of confidence, um, then it, it, it's just, it frustrates and scares them. So, you know, pathological optimism, a great deal of self-confidence. Um, uh, you have to be able to, um, you don't, I, I'm not saying multitask because multi, you, you never want to multitask, but you, you have to be able to focus on a lot of different things, meaning like, Focus on this thing to, through to completion, move to the next thing. So you have to be able to be very, very versatile with your skill set. I mean, gosh, in the, the very first days of MindTouch, I wrote a little bit of code. You know, my background's computer science, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I wrote a little bit of code in the early days of MindTouch, uh, mostly like front-end stuff, right? Then, then um, uh, I, I did some uh, product, uh, a lot of product work, like, you know, designing, helping to design the product. Um, then I did a lot of uh, community work and then marketing work. And, and uh, I mean, the role just changes a lot, you know. So you really have to be versatile. Um, I guess those are three big things right mm -hmm. there. And work with other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have to be. I, I don't know that. I've known, I've known plenty of entrepreneurs that are pretty poor managers. So it certainly helps a great deal to be a good manager. And, um, it's something that I really, uh, and I'm, it's a skill I'm constantly studying up on. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, I would rank that probably below the other ones to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're not a good manager, you better, you better, prov you better surround yourself with people that are. Mm -hmm. If one wanted to, how would one get a job like yours? Oh, you just have to, you know, you do it, you know, I mean, gosh, I, I've done, so many businesses. I got, you know, my first one making edible glue gunk egg 
putting it in the little silly putty eggs and selling it at school to <laughs> um, taking wholesale miniature, you know, uh, pewter miniatures that I, I, I uh, bought wholesale through mail order and then reselling them retail at different conventions to, um, uh, gosh, you know, I, 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 I had a printing business. I had a web design business. I mean, all of these things I did, I mean, you just, you just keep at it, you know, you keep at it and you have to, you have to be willing to fail. Mm. You know? I have a great idea for a, a software product. How would I bring that to fruition? The, the first thing is, is focus on the minimally viable product. Everybody thinks of like, oh, and then I can do this. And then it's going to, you know, read people's minds. And then it's going to solve world <laughs> hunger. And then it's like, you know what? Just don't, even, don't even worry about any of that nonsense. Focus on the minimally viable product. What's one or two features that you can bring to market? That's the first thing that people, I mean, that everybody, I, I had people approach me about this all the time. And consistently they, they go, oh, I want to do an iPad app for education. Gosh, you know, well, tell me more about that. Oh, that's a great idea. You know, you could really have a nice app that does this very simple thing and it would be very valuable and people would like to buy that. Oh, but wait, and then I'm going to do this and, and then it's going to control robots. And it's like, no, 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 just minimally viable product, man. Uh, and I think that's that's the feeling of most people who try to be entrepreneurs is they, they don't focus on the first step. They focus on the end goal. They focus on the last step. If there is such a thing, what's a typical day like for you? Oh, uh, I mean, it, it depends. Um, you know, nowadays I do a lot of uh, marketing, um, uh, you know, product messaging, product positioning. Uh, I like to be really involved with customers, so I'll jump on sales calls. I still do. I love jumping <laughs> on sales calls with customers. I love it. Um, I'll jump on support calls with customers that, you know, heck, sometimes we make mistakes and we have unhappy customers. Gratefully, it's not too often. In fact, I'm so proud of the fact that we have a 97% customer satisfaction score. Uh, so, you know, I mean, but if we do have an unhappy customer, I'll jump on a call and talk mm -hmm. to them. Uh, so uh, I talk to a lot of journalists. I talk to a lot of analysts. Uh, um, I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of reading. Um, yeah, I mean, I do a lot of one-on-ones with key stakeholders at MindTouch, uh, the VP of sales, the, uh, um, the marketing team, the VP of product, the VP of engineering, the head of support. I do a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, 30-minute uh, meetings in, a, in mm. a given week. Are you up at 5 or more like 11? Uh, no, no. I have uh, two, two small children, so I'm up at uh, typically <laughs> 6. And um, I go to bed generally around um, midnight, asleep by like one. So, uh, you know, thankfully I don't need much sleep. Aaron, everybody has to give themselves motivation occasionally. How do you give yourself a kick in the pants? Well, um, one of the things that I, I learned, uh, I read a book called Spark, and it's about uh, the neuroscience and exercise. And um, that's something that really changed me for the better is I realized that if I exercise, I can become much more focused. And, um, so, you know, my office is about four miles away. I jog to work, uh, or I bike to work. Um, I try to exercise every single day. Um, and, um, you know, I, I really enjoy running long distances, like half marathons, I'm going to do an adventure marathon with my wife in Australia this year. Um, but another thing that, to be honest, that I um, I really enjoy is, is mosh pits. <laughs> <laughs> so punk, punk rock concerts or uh, very high energy mosh pits. That's that's good good for my soul. <laughs> Let me turn the question around. When you have to soothe yourself, how do you calm yourself down? Um, yeah, exercise and mosh pits. <laughs> <laughs> Same answer. <laughs> Honestly, it's it's totally true. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same answer. And um, I, I guess another another thing that uh, 
both relaxes me and energizes me is uh, family time. You know, you know that's something that uh, I, I'm I'm a very very active father and husband. Um, when I'm home, I'm home. I'm focused. Uh, so, you know, nothing pleases me more than time with the kids and my wife. Is there an event in your life that has challenged you to the core? Um, at least once a year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, uh, uh, um, yeah, at least once a year. I mean, um, gosh, you know, I mean, I- I've been homeless when I was younger. Um, you know, I've, uh, and I've been in some pretty tough spots when I was younger. Um, nowadays it's more, it's more about, um, you know, decisions I have to make that affect other people that make me, uh, definitely feel challenged. I mean, honestly, I, I, I grew up an anarchist, I mean, <laughs> literally that, um, government is, uh, uh, was, was something that, that was, uh, um, not not necessarily beneficial okay um and now i i am the man you know (laughs) i've become the man and um that's something that it's taken me some time to get accustomed to Mm -hmm. um i've become accustomed to it for the sake of the people that i work for meaning my employees uh because i've realized that um uh you know i have to make the hard decisions so that they don't have to is there an idea or a principle that helps you through your challenges? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Buddha Dharma, you know, um, absolutely it does. You know, uh, it's easy to lose sight on, uh, to lose sight of what's reality, you know. Um, it's easy to begin to focus on, uh, achievements right the destination instead of just really enjoying the journey because my gosh it's so much fun Uh, when you can focus on just the journey is it's so wonderful um so yeah i mean uh, for me buddha dharma absolutely um i mean i think i think i'm again i think i'm just really lucky because i love my work and i know people that i grew up with um i have a group of friends that we go back to kindergarten i mean uh well elementary school a couple of us one good friend, kindergarten and elementary school. Um, there's eight of us, right? And we all grew up in the Bay Area, and they're all very accomplished people. But, you know, these guys have jobs or maybe a career, but they don't have a calling. And, I mean, I, f- I feel like I have a calling. So it just it makes things much more enjoyable. If you're giving a commencement address for high school or college, what would you say? What I generally tell people is develop your ability to love and develop your ability to work. Um, if you enjoy both, you're going to have a great life. And uh, don't ever waste time doing stuff that you don't care about. Like if, if what you care about is, I don't know, worm farms, go do it. You know, don't worry about what, what uh, you have for income. One of the things I, I've learned from being, I mean, like I said, you know, being, being dirt poor, even being homeless for a period, you really don't need much to live <laughs> comfortably. And, um, you know, people, people get caught up in thinking that they need things that they don't really need. So just follow your passions, follow what you care about, and you'll be a lot happier. You have to work with a lot of people. Do you have any favorite job interview questions that you use when selecting them? Yeah. Um, I love uh, Tony Shea from Zappos' question about, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, how lucky you are. Are you? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if they come back at you with like, oh, I'm a 1, or I'm really unlucky, you know, either they're really pessimistic or they're really unlucky. <laughs> Which, <laughs> in either case, you don't want to work with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a pretty another, good self-selector. <laughs> yeah, another thing is, and I've had people tell me, Oh man, I'm so unlucky. I'm like a one or a two. <laughs> All right, interview over. Um, <laughs> You're right. You're out of here. <laughs> so, so the other thing is, is that um, there's been there's been uh, research that shows that uh, people who are uh, consider themselves to be lucky just look for opportunity. They look for opportunities that other people don't look for. That's that's the difference between people who consider themselves to be lucky and people who 
who uh, don't is that people who consider themselves to be lucky look for opportunities where others don't, and they'll find it. Uh, so, um, you know, I've, I, I do a lot of logic puzzles just to hear how they think through things, um, also because that's how we did it at Microsoft. Um, I ask them uh, what's something interesting about themselves. That's my standard question I ask every time. What's something interesting about yourself? And they'll be like, I'm a hard worker, blah, blah, blah. And I'll just call them, that's such a bullshit answer. And really, that's the, you got nothing? Well, <laughs> you know, and it, it, sometimes they'll be like, it, well, personal or professionally? And I'm like, I don't know. What do you think's interesting? And um, that's one of the best questions you can ask because it tells you a lot about the person with how they answer that question. I always ask what their parents do. What, mm -hmm. what do your parents do? Um, or d what do they do? Uh, that tells me a lot, too. Um, so uh, I'll tell you one thing is whenever I meet somebody who grew up in a family owned restaurant, um, I hire them. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's worked out for me 100% of the time. <laughs> I want to thank Aaron Fulkerson for joining me today. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really enjoyed it. If you'd like to leave a comment, ask a question, or get more info, go to whatsitlike.info.